It was early summer. The hillside saw from the window of my house was covered with a green carpet. Look, this very valley of Wisconsin was just like that scene of my childhood. Look at that setting sun. This was just like my home, my home. I was a human being once. Could I ever go back there? Could I ever become a part of that nature? Could I ever become a human being again? I fell upon my knees and, forgetting myself, began to pray. My reason was with me. The leaves on the branches grew large. The air was full of early summer fragrance. The sunset was red and beautiful. I began to feel the difference between cold and warmth in the temperature. I had to leave this camp in Wisconsin in the latter part of May 1942. This was an important place formed. I will never forget it. I will never forget Colonel Rogers. 250 Japanese internees left McCoy on the train that took us to Chicago. Then from Chicago, through the vast plains of Illinois, the train carried us southward and I fell asleep. When I woke up, the train was speeding through the green fields of Kentucky. I remembered that Abraham Lincoln had been born in one of those farmhouses in Kentucky. We entered Tennessee and crossed the Tennessee River, winding through the Alleghenies, and I remembered the Tennessee Valley Authority. When the sun was shining against the hills, we arrived at a town that made me think of a fort city of Europe. It was Nashville. The train I was on was carrying some American troops. Members of a service organization came along and gave refreshments to the soldiers. This struck me as strange. They wore white aprons over their dresses, and they handed out fruit, picture cards, and candies. They called hi, soldiers, and seemed very friendly. As I was with the soldiers, I received a bag of candies myself. There were young ladies and some old, but the majority were middle-aged. They looked neat and simply. They were sincere and kind. They seemed really interested in giving the soldiers comfort. I wondered if the women of Japan would realise that the women of America were not all like the female characters in a Hollywood movie. When we arrived at the new camp, I saw five Japanese who had been brought in from the warm state of Florida. They told us of their life in America. I just listened to them without saying anything. I turned on the radio in the recreation room. The announcer said that a Japanese submarine skipper had just arrived in the camp. I did not feel good. I went to my hut. A Japanese internee came and cleaned my hut. Please don't do it, I said. Give me that broom. I did not want anyone to do my job. I was grateful for the kindness of other Japanese, but I could not accept it. The camp was covered with tall oak trees, but the sun was strong, and the rays that came through the branches of the oak trees were scorching hot. It was like midsummer in southern Japan. Our main amusement was the squirrels that visited us every day. Every afternoon, clouds rose in the direction of Oklahoma, and there was a terrific shower. In this camp, there were six rows of huts. Each hut accommodated five or six people. As I lived in one of those huts, for the first time since my capture, I associated with other Japanese. There were some Italians, there were gay Italians, and melancholy Italians. Some of them lived the day just waiting for an exchange ship. Others spoke to me. I was struck by the sight of hairy men walking in pants. They whistled tunes as they walked. The Japanese internees held classes every day. English, geography, agriculture, Buddhism and theology. I attended every one of them. There was news broadcasting in the evenings. I learned that midget submarines had attacked Sydney, that there was some fighting off Madagascar, and also that there were fierce engagements in the Aleutians and at Midway. In that Midway battle, the newspaper reported that the air struggle was particularly fierce. The Japanese secret code had been broken, I heard. The United States was getting ready for a showdown fight. Damaged warships were repaired at Pearl Harbor and sent into service. The US Air Force had concentrated its striking power at Midway. Large air reinforcements had been flown there. They were ready for a Japanese attack by the surface ships. To try to fight airplanes was suicidal for warships. A blind man did not fear a snake. What I feared came true. The Battle of Midway began. It was fought in the air. I knew what an aircraft carrier could do. Already the American forces knew by the use of carrier-based patrol planes where the Japanese ships were. They could tell every step of the approaching Japanese. The fighter planes from both sides met. From the beginning to the end, it was an air battle. I thought perhaps the two sides were well matched. 
But the result was a disastrous Japanese defeat. Perhaps the broken code was fatal to the Japanese side. I saw a movie at this camp for the first time since the war. Diana Durbin played the leading role. The film had been provided by the United Service Organisations. There was great excitement at the camp one day when the group being repatriated left. Some well-meaning friends asked, what shall be port to the Navy when we get back? I said nothing. I saw them off in silence as they marched out from the gate of the camp. My life at Camp Forest came to an end. Next, I was moved to Camp Livingston, Louisiana. When I arrived at this camp, the work on the site had not yet been completed. Soldiers stationed here were going through training for jungle warfare in the South Pacific. I was met by Japanese civilian internees. It was a very hot day. Most of them were residents of the United States, but there were some who had been brought in from South and Central America, mostly from Panama. They spoke Spanish among themselves, and except for their racial appearance, they did not have much in common with the rest. Many of them were young men. There were altogether about 1,250 of us. I was housed in a separate hut near the entrance of the camp. Next to my hut was the hall for visitors. Families of Japanese internees came by train and automobile, some of them travelling more than 2,000 miles. The commander of the internee camp was Colonel Dan. He allowed me, without a guard, to spend the daytime with the civilian internees. Mr Fisher, a young men's Christian association secretary, visited me and talked to me alone. Although I understood him only in part, it was enough to give me additional assurance that there were people in the world who cared even formed. What influence those kind-hearted individuals had upon my life cannot be adequately measured or told. I can only say that those human touches had begun to work on me with strange power. If anyone had tried to change me or my mind, if, indeed, any American army officer or religious worker had shown the slightest sign of trying to convert me, I am sure that, being in the mental condition I was in, I would have reacted with extreme scepticism. In fact, I would have rigidly closed my mind, but they used no verbal propaganda. They did not try to tell me I or even Japan was wrong. They only wanted me to know and feel that in their minds I was human. The Japanese had an internment university, and lectures were held in English, geography and penmanship. This list includes painting, sculpture, commerce, economics, agriculture, music, Japanese poetry, jiu-jitsu, Japanese dancing, Buddhist scriptures, and theology. The chief of the educational activities was the Reverend Kano, a Japanese Episcopal clergyman from Nebraska. The faculty men under him were mostly professionally trained teachers and artists. The students were 20 years of age and older. Some students were as much as 70 years old. It was a thrilling experience to see these elderly men go to school with younger persons. I wanted my folks back home to see this. In Japan, people at that age would merely retire into respectable uselessness. The Battle of Guadalcanal began. It seemed that the United States had started an offensive in real earnest. The war had entered a white-hot stage. In September, I moved to a corner of Area H in the camp. I spent most of my time studying. From the newspapers I learned that some Japanese soldiers had been captured. Now I knew I had company. I watched the activities of these Japanese civilian internees. Their orderly life, well administered, was a constant source of inspiration to me. I had a lot to learn from these people who had spent most of their adult life in the United States. One day in November when I was attending a class of the internment university, a guard came and said, you are going over to another area to be with other combat prisoners. I thanked the Japanese friends who had taught me so much and left the area. I met 50 new prisoners. They were from patrol ships that had covered Wake Island, patrol ships that had met the carrier from which the planes of the Tokyo raid of April 18 took off, and from submarines that had taken part in the Aleutian campaign. There were also prisoners from the Battle of Midway. Commander Nakamoon was the ranking officer among them. I heard the latest news of Japan from them. I was at once given the job of gathering news for the new arrivals, who did not know quite what was going on. On January 1, 1943, however, 16 prisoners led by Commander Nakamoon left for another camp, leaving me in charge of the remaining 36 men. This was a tremendous responsibility, 
for the new prisoners were not as tamed as the civilians. They sometimes showed signs of hostility toward the Americans. I wanted to prevent incidents by providing positive activities. I called the entire camp to a meeting. I declared my policy, announced rules and regulations of the camp, organized the camp into groups, set up a daily schedule, and founded evening classes. I wanted to build a wholesome camp atmosphere by making possible full exercise of mind, heart, and hands. Inactivity bred melancholia. Idle men imagined scenes of battle. Their status as prisoners of war made them, as Japanese soldiers and sailors, feel ashamed and dejected. I called them to the study hall and taught them American geography, American affairs, the fundamentals of English, mathematics, Japanese and Chinese. I tried to lead them to live a peaceful life without depressing worries. I encouraged all kinds of recreation. Softball, ping-pong, basketball, tennis. On Sundays we played softball with the civilians. We also worked to beautify our area. Some complained that we lacked discipline. Life was too free. Strong-armed men bossed too much. I tried to improve conditions by education. In February 1943, a group of ten prisoners led by Lieutenant Commander Matsumoto arrived from the Solomons. The sixteen who had gone west came back, without Commander Nakamoon who had become insane. I turned over the leadership to Lieutenant Commander Matsumoto and looked after the non-commissioned officers. The arrival of these men told eloquently how the war was going. At the beginning of 1943, Colonel Dan was replaced by Colonel Weaver. Colonel Weaver told us one day, My brother was a lieutenant of the United States Navy. He was with the cruiser Astoria. You recall that when your ambassador, Mr. Saito, died, the cruiser took the body of the ambassador to Japan. My brother received fine treatment from the Japanese people. He was always saying good things about the land of cherry blossoms, then, when this war came, both he and the Astoria were sunk by the Japanese. I cannot like the Japan that caused the death of my brother, but I would not forget the things he said about your country and people. You can rest assured that I will do my duty as the commander of this camp to the best of my ability. It was said in a very friendly, though not undignified, manner. The short winter was soon over. Then spring came. One day in May, it was a hot day, the order was delivered to us to go north to Camp McCoy, the camp where I spent my first months in the United States. I assembled the men and talked to them about Camp McCoy. I told them how the Geneva Convention concerning war prisoners worked. When I came back to Camp McCoy, there were many Nisei soldiers in training who later fought in Italy. This was the same camp that I had lived in before, and yet how many different things I noticed the second time. I saw robins, blue jays and sparrows in the branches of the pine trees. Deer and pheasants from the nearby forests often strayed into our camp. When rabbits and gophers jumped inside, we had a good time chasing them. We were welcomed by friendly Colonel Rogers. According to the Geneva regulations, we were assigned to some labour. We were well organised and well disciplined. The Colonel seemed pleased with us. He tried to make us feel at home and human, his words and deeds helped us forget that we were prisoners of war. Sometimes, for our amusement and recreation, we were allowed to hunt small birds in the woods. We also made small huts for pigeons, pheasants and later rabbits. We planted vegetables in our own gardens. Potatoes, cabbage, radishes, eggplants, melons, watermelons, beans and spinach. When these vegetables appeared on our tables, the men were very happy. After our arrival, a recreation and workroom was set up with a laundry machine, a sewing machine and an electric iron. It was just about this time that the midget submarine had left behind was taken around the country to spur the war bond drive. It came to a town not far from the camp. I realised that through my error the submarine was now performing a strange duty. Instead of sinking a warship, it was raising money with which to fight against Japan. The strange thing was that I did not take it too hard. I knew then how much I had really changed. The war situation was increasingly unfavourable for Japan, and Americans brought in additional prisoners who were desperate men. In September 1943, 30 men were brought in from Attu Island. At the end of 1943, groups of 10 and 20, some of them suffering from malaria, came in. They were soldiers, sailors and civilians. By the 1st of 1944, the total reached 100. Tarawa and the Marshall Islands sent another 100. 
Thus, in April, there were more than 200 Japanese prisoners. The camp was too small to accommodate them all. Officers were segregated and housed in one section of the infirmary. Colonel Rogers said to us one day, Hear that you feel that you are fated to die. Some of you told us that your plight is desperate. Others among you petitioned us to recognise your customs and traditional ideas about being prisoners of the enemy. I understand all that, but please remember that a Japanese who was once a prisoner of the enemy later became a minister of the state. So why don't you relax and forget your ideas about being prisoners? Colonel Rogers' reference to a minister was about a man who played a prominent role in the Meiji Restoration. True, he was a prisoner once, but the enemy was a rival faction in a civil war. We were not able to feel very relaxed, as Colonel Rogers suggested. The psychology of the men in our camp was radically different and tense. The exchange ship brought tea and vitamin pills from Japan. The American Red Cross received them and gave us some of them. We were very grateful. Green tea made us homesick. The vitamin pills were served to ease our nerves. In spite of the mental suffering of the new prisoners, our camp life was relatively peaceful. It was well organised and there was unity. We did our work efficiently. The new arrivals were surprised and said, This camp life is better run than the army life in Japan. The harmony between the superiors and subordinates is very well maintained. To tell you the honest truth, we first thought that you were behaving so well because you were afraid of the Americans. But after a few days we found out that you do everything voluntarily. This is not a military life. This is more like a spiritual training camp. I attribute this to the environment entirely. No wonder Commander Matsumoto used to say, this is really wonderful training. I must get as much as possible out of this life. Saipan in the Pacific and Normandy in Europe were twin engagements whose outcomes would decide the future of the global war. We were sensitive to the events outside the camp. Then Italy surrendered. This caused us to sink markedly in morale. The invasion of Normandy was accomplished. Saipan fell to the American forces. After the fall of Saipan, our camp population jumped at once to more than a thousand. Alas, the war had now turned into a rout for Japan. Before I recovered from the shock, the cabinets changed in Japan. The road went downward steadily. What could I do? If I stared at the little flowers among the weeds, they were only white little flowers. If I looked at the wall of the infirmary, the colour remained creamy white. Everything seemed to say to me, you are only one individual. There is nothing you can do about it. I turned my mind more and more to philosophy. Although my knowledge of English was inadequate, I read English books in order to find out more about the world, science and life itself. What change, however, had come over me? I compared the present with the time when I was alone in this camp. I was struggling with the problem of life and death. Now it seemed that even in this life as a prisoner of war, there was something new to learn every day, and instead of suffering from my own problems, I was now teaching others. I had more reasoning power than I had ever had. I felt confident. I felt a responsibility to lead others. I got ready for more prisoners to come. On February 4, 1945, 200 officers and men arrived from the Marianas. Lieutenant Commander Narita became our new leader. One day Lieutenant Colonel Fillinger came to see us. He was doing everything possible as an engineer to make our life comfortable, which made us very grateful. He said, in an obvious effort to comfort us, Saipan fell, the Philippine Islands are reconquered. Now the Okinawa campaign is coming to an end. I know how all of you feel about your country. America's victory is now assured, so you see all of Japan is going to be our prisoner. It is not just you, there is no reason to feel ashamed. When it is all over, we will let you go. You will be happy, won't you? He meant well, but we were sad about the whole situation. We hoped that the kamikazes would do their job and somehow turn the tide. We were moved again. This time we were brought to Camp Kennedy in Texas. There were rows of small huts. This camp had been built since the war. There were many trees. As soon as we unloaded our luggage and looked around, we knew from the way the gardens had been taken care of that Japanese internees lived here before. From the Marianas and Iwo Jima, 60 new prisoners arrived. Germany had surrendered. With that depressing fact in the background, we started our semi-tropical life in the new camp. Officers were segregated from conscripted men, 
giving me more leisure which I used for study. During July and August there were fifty more new arrivals. The war reached the final stage. We heard about the atomic bomb and the entry of Russia into war. We were shocked and repentant. We were combatants all. This meant that our country's defeat was our responsibility. We fought and lost. We could not blame the heavens. We could not blame others. We could not complain. It was all our fault. It was we who were weak. It was we who were inadequate. It was we who were ignorant. There was nothing we could say. We could only apologise. We could only shed tears. There were some who could not believe that Japan had lost the war. They rubbed their eyes, but the fact was inescapable. I said to myself, we've lost the war. We must return and work in silence. We must rebuild our country with our own hands. That is the only way we can pay our debts. Our daily routine of work and study went on as usual after the end of the war. We were resolved that when we returned to Japan, we would lay the new foundation of a new Japan. Thus, on December 1, 1945, we left our Texas camp and started our long journey homeward. There were 800 of us on this trip. When the new year dawned upon us, I was on the Pacific Ocean, leaving four years of life as a prisoner behind me. The life in the prisoners' camps was not as simple as I have just described it. There were endless internal conflicts among the men. But the most persistent and difficult problem was the rivalry and jealousy between army and navy personnel. In order to understand the tension day in and day out, it is necessary to relate the story in one continuous sequence and tell it apart from the chronology. I tell it here so that the reader may get a glimpse into the background of the inter-service feud that played not too small a part in the making of history as far as Japan is concerned. The best and the only way to reveal this perpetual conflict is by narrating the development of a situation involving some leading personalities with whom we shared our life behind barbed wire. I was introduced to about 50 new prisoners at Camp Livingston. They had just got out of the army trucks which brought them. They stood and stared at me curiously, some with real hostility. They all had heavy beards on their faces. Their appearance was grotesque, to put it simply. To them I was, no doubt, a picture of failure, more so than themselves, because I was the first to fail. I stared back at them. Neither side said anything. The men were assigned to their barracks. I did not feel like meeting any of them, but when I passed by an officer's barrack, an aggressive-looking tall man came out and said, You are Sakamaki-san, aren't you? He sounded rather cocky, but invited me in. When I entered, I saw an older man in a blue jacket. He was stout and seemed about forty-two years of age. He just stood there and looked me over. I felt chills running down my spine. Commander Nakamoon, said the first officer. I bowed. There was another man. He was Ensign Kanda. The man who had invited me was Lieutenant Kadyamoto. Commander Nakamuna was the leader of the fifty new prisoners. I learned that he had been the aircraft carrier Hirius Chief Engineer. When the carrier was sunk at Midway, he barely made a lifeboat. He drifted about the Pacific Ocean for fifteen days, half dead. He was picked up by an American warship. Commander Nakamoon had a wife and children in Japan. His oldest son was a student at the Tokyo Imperial University. Unlike other Japanese officers, he did not hide his affection and longing for his wife. This, however, damaged his dignity among the men, particularly among the army personnel. One day the commander called me in, and when we were alone said in all seriousness, There is no telling what will happen to us here. We may have to die. I, for one, am ready for anything I trust you are. Then, on the day when he and fifty other prisoners received an order to transfer to another camp in California, Commander Nakamoon turned pale and shivered all over. He said grimly, I don't think they are going to send us to California. I know where they are taking us, Washington, D.C. You know what they are going to do to us there. They are going to torture us and hang us. After this, he was always attempting suicide and failing in it. He once cut his belly with a razor blade. He jumped from the beam. One day he brought a baseball bat to me and said, Ensign Sakamaki, will you hit me with all you might? He bent down and patted the back of his bald head. Here, hit me here with this. I did not touch the bat. Kill me, kill me, I beg you, he asked seriously, coming close to me. Seeing that I would not take the bat, he dropped it and sat facing me. 
He wrung his neck with his large hands and said, You are strong, Ensign. Just squeeze my neck for five minutes, then it will be all over. I just can't stand it. I want to end it all right now. I refused to obey him. Commander Nakamoon had a curious but unique method of self-torture. He had imagined that the United States government was operating a powerful wireless station in Washington, D.C., and that strong waves of electric ether were being aimed at all prisoners. Commander Nakamoon supposed himself to be particularly receptive to those waves. According to his calculation, he was worth a 100,000 volts of live electricity. When he could not stand the ether wave, he took a bath. He was in the bath several times a day. If the ether waves caught him out of his bath, he hurriedly covered his bald head with a wet towel. The towel was full of broken glass pieces, which he thought prevented electricity from penetrating him. When he came to me with the bat, he complained that he had too much electricity inside him. They are sending it now. I am being overcharged with it. My heart is a condenser, and my stomach a reactor. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. The baseball bat was not an accident. He was a real baseball fan and not too bad at playing it either. He used to play first base and caught the ball I threw from third base almost professionally. Later, however, I had to take him off the line up for a reason which I will explain soon. When I refused to cooperate with him in his scheme of self-destruction, he started to cry. He was worried about his family. Whenever a new prisoner arrived, he grabbed him and asked, Do you know anything about my son? More than once he asked me the same question, and I gave him the same answer. Don't worry. Your family thinks you have died honorably. He believed it and smiled happily. Then the electric waves would come. He would tremble and ask, Do you think my family is all right? The Americans are sending the electric waves all the way to Japan. America is very advanced technologically. Look what they have done to me already. I am half mechanized, you laugh. But you see, because I am a machine, I can hear the message from Japan too. My family is all right now. The waves are not so strong today. I did not laugh. It was not so funny when I remembered that in my early days as a prisoner, my own head used to feel like this. I was nervous as the commander was. I was all nerves myself. Then my imagination controlled my thinking. Commander Nakamoon was going through the same stage. The only question was, would he calm down some day? I wanted to protect and help the commander. He was not only my superior in the Navy, but another human being going through the same experience that I had gone through. I did everything I possibly could. I washed his dirty underwear. I kept my eyes on him constantly, but what I had feared finally came. One day he was jumping around in the campground shouting madly. I rushed out and held him in my arms to calm him, but he was already out of his mind. He was taken to the infirmary and stayed there permanently. Lieutenant Kander also went out of his mind. He ran wildly over the ground, calling his wife's name. He, too, was taken to the infirmary. The loss of these two officers was a blow to us all. It was a terrible blow. I took over the leadership from Commander Nakamune. Then one day came Lieutenant Commander Matsumoto. In deference to his superior rank, I gave way to him. He was a much older person than Commander Nakamune. Despite his age, he was a bundle of energy. He had had an extraordinary career in the Navy. In 1905, when he was 18, he took part in the famous naval engagement in the Japan Sea against the Russian fleet. He had spent 40 years in active service. This fact commanded the respect of U.S. lesser men. But he was arrogant and seemed quite ruthless. I feared that his leadership would create trouble. So when he said to me, I am much too old to direct camp life, you act as my deputy and do everything, I was frankly relieved but what he meant was that I should do as he ordered. I did not mind it, except that his methods did not promise to create harmony with the army personnel, who, with the development of the war situations, seemed to grow in number. Commander Matsumoto liked to make paper dolls of all things. He was good at it, and it was known that the American commanding officer liked them so well that he kept some dolls in his office. The American soldiers nicknamed Commander Matsumoto Old Paper Doll Maker. But the young Japanese prisoners, particularly the army men, did not think too much of the old man's hobby. Up to this point it was all a navy show, but with the succession of undignified activities of the naval officers, there seemed to have arisen a feeling among the ranks of the army officers and men 
that an opening wedge had been made. No doubt looking for some excitement, several younger officers came to see the old paper doll maker. They intended to ridicule him, they said. You make fine dolls, but doll making does not seem to be a hobby becoming an officer of the navy. This was plainly asking for trouble. Commander Matsumoto pushed paper and paste aside and rose up deliberately. He stared at everyone, and his breath became hot and his breathing fast. The room was charged with his wrath, he roared. Who do you think you are? I may be old, but I have not lost my sense of judgment. You are too young to know what I am doing this for. Now get out and mind your own business. The commander had wanted to promote peaceful hobbies among the prisoners, to keep them happy until he succeeded in bringing them safely home to Japan. But even to suggest that warriors of Japan dreamed of returning home after being prisoners was considered to be an act of high treason. This was like admitting spy activities. The recalcitrant younger men seized this as an opportunity and started a vicious rumour. Anybody who is thinking of going home alive is not a Japanese soldier. Anybody who loves life so much is not a soldier. These behind-the-back talks were like calling Matsumoto a coward and cheat. Such accusations sound strange, but that was the old official ideology of the Japanese militarists. So the officers of lower ranks and of the army used it as an excuse to get rid of the old man as the leader. Matsumoto and the commanding officer were very friendly too. The commander often seemed over-anxious to please the American officer. This was unbecoming a Japanese soldier, the accusers said among themselves. One evening the officers gave a welcome party for a few army officers who had just arrived from Guadalcanal. Ostensibly the occasion was for the promotion of friendly relations between the army and navy in captivity. Unfortunately, however, the old grudge pushed its head up as beer swells the heads of the men. The commander opened up. The camp looks harmonious on the surface, but underneath there is trouble. One of the newcomers asked innocently, What's wrong? Tis the problem of ranks, also the problem of work. The army is the troublemaker. Lieutenant Sato of the army pretended not to hear it. The navy commander went on. Take, for instance, Ensign Sakamaki and Lieutenant Ui. Both are graduates of the same year, but the ensign was captured earlier. So, since the prison camp has no promotion, he stays an ensign, while a man who comes in later has had a chance for promotion. This is a typical case, so sometimes younger men, when they come here, find themselves superior in rank to older men. It goes to their heads. The trouble with work is that the conscripted men do physical labour, and according to the Geneva Convention receive 80 cents a day. But the officers are not supposed to stoop to such work, so they get 10 cents a day. Some superiors must wash the inferiors' underwear in order to earn spending money. Then the men who work in the vegetable gardens function as if they are feeding the officers. Nothing happened at this party, but the issues had been clearly defined by the talkative commander. The day after the emperor's birthday was the holiday of the Yasukuni Shrine, the shrine for the soldiers and sailors who died in war. We held a service of prayer, but when the last incense was burned, everyone was ready to leave. Commander Matsumoto got up on the platform and shouted, Wait, everyone! We held our breath in the atmosphere of tense silence. The commander began, We are living together here. If all of us adhere to the virtue of humility, there should be no cleavage between the army and navy. But there is someone among you who is stirring up trouble. He wants to fish in troubled water. I will identify him soon. I looked around. Lieutenant Sato of the army was grinning meaningfully and mysteriously. Commander Matsumoto went on. You of the army may feel dissatisfied. You may feel that you are dominated by the navy here, but that is not true. If an army man with a higher rank than myself should arrive here, I will gladly give him the command of the camp. But until then I cannot, and I will not tolerate anyone who connives to disobey my authority. Such a plotter will be exposed and punished severely. He looked over the room, and when his eyes recognized Lieutenant Sato, his eyes stopped as if frozen. Lieutenant Sato! shouted at the commander. The room was electrified. The commander seemed unable to control himself any more. He gave a command in a hot, short sentence. From now on, no one will be permitted to hold a meeting without my consent. Dismissed, the meeting broke up without incident. But when I went back to my room, 
I thought that something had to be done or that something would happen. Something did happen. Commander Matsumoto had gone to the latrine after the meeting and slipped on the icy step. He fell hard and lost control of himself. A medical officer of the army looked at the semi-conscious man and declared, heart attack and some internal bleeding. Tonight, we'll tell the story. The commanding officer of the camp was notified. Lieutenant Colonel Rogers came at once and looked after Matsumoto like an intimate friend in trouble. The commander survived, so did the old trouble between the two services. But since Matsumoto was incapacitated, the leadership was transferred to a young army man, Lieutenant Kajimoto, who, like Commander Nakamune, was from Midway. Lieutenant Kajimoto was a modest and serious man. He described his new job in these words, Now I have the most difficult job in the whole army. It seemed that Kajimoto was thoroughly tired of everything, and really anxious to call it a day any time. But he said, It's not easy to die. Only living is much more difficult. A few days later, a fierce fight broke out in the recreation room over the question of who was first at the pool table. It turned out that a younger army man with a higher rank demanded his turnover, a navy man who was one year his senior in age. The two exchanged body blows, and one of them was knocked down unconscious and wounded severely. The next day the new leader called everyone, appearing lifeless. Kahimoto announced his determination. We had a violent fight yesterday. Whether it was yesterday or not is not important. This camp is full of trouble. As we are forced to live together, we are apt to have trouble. Sometimes you feel like shocking somebody. I was on a carrier off Midway. After the ship was sunk, I drifted around fifteen days before I was captured. So I have no claim to an officer's rank. In a prisoner's camp, all ranks are meaningless as far as rights are concerned. But until my rank is taken away from me by a court-martial, I must perform my duties accordingly. I will not give you orders, but I would like to appeal to your reason. I have only one thing to say to you. If you make any more trouble, you will see me no more in this world. That and the segregation of officers ended the trouble for the time being. Perhaps my brief chronology on the camps or the conflict between the army and navy is not particularly significant. If someone else had been captured on December 8, 1941, instead of me, he would have had good treatment and a gradual change of outlook on life as I had. The jealousy between the two branches of the service is not perhaps peculiarly Japanese. There was one thing, however, which I am rather sure was unique with the Japanese prisoner of war. I cannot completely give an honest account of our camp experiences unless I go into the problem of the psychology of suicide which was ever present in any Japanese prisoner of war camp. One night, the clock in the infirmary struck two. Suddenly someone shouted, Attack! Charge! It was Sergeant Ikawa. He was out of bed, jumping around. Someone hastened to him and hugged him. Sergeant Ikawa, this is an infirmary. Please calm yourself. What, you Yamakawa, what are you waiting for? It's my order. Attack! Private First Class Yamakawa takes over and lead the attack. Hurry! Sergeant was back on Atu. He was wounded and in great pain. Sergeant Ikawa, this is Ensign Sakamaki, I said. You will be all right soon. Please go to sleep. What? Something's wrong here. Who cut my leg? I have lost my leg. Hey, Yamakawa, bring me a hand grenade. You go ahead. I am going to blast the enemy and myself together. Captain Pintozzi, the American medical officer in charge, came and asked, What's going on? Sergeant recognized it as English. I hear English. The enemy is here. The enemy is attacking. Come on, Yamakawa, attack. Sergeant, Sergeant, this is Ensign Sakamaki. Commander Matsumoto is here too. That was the captain. We are at Camp McCoy. I'm hurt. Ensign Sakamaki, you say that was our medical captain. He... Oh, then it's all right. Thank you. The captain gave him an injection of morphine and the sergeant quieted down. Old Commander Matsumoto put the blanket over the sergeant. I remembered about the sergeant. He was nearly frozen on Atu. He had not slept for several days. Finally, he tried to blow himself up with a hand grenade. He did blow himself up partially, but only the bottom half of his body was blown off. He lay in the trench, asleep, half dead, a few days later. When the Americans were cleaning up the corpses, they came upon the sergeant. They found his heart still beating, so they carried him out and put him on board a transport bound for Seattle. This ship is overcrowded and he won't live anyway, we had better abandon him, someone suggested. No, 
We cannot give up on a human being as long as his heart is beating. Put him in the operating room. As the operation progressed, the sergeant began to regain consciousness. He looked around and saw unfamiliar faces. With weak breath, he murmured, America. Oh, I'm a prisoner then. Sergeant Ikawa lived in the agony of being a prisoner. Petty Officer Kawamoto came into my room. He was crying. I cried with him. Why I cried, I could not explain. Kawamoto was crying because he was a prisoner and alive. Ensign Sakamaki, do you understand me? I was fighting against a cruiser. My sub was already crippled, but we fought and fought. Then we hit something. Perhaps it was a collision with the enemy cruiser. Bang, bang, bang. The whole submarine shook and everything went wild. We began to sink. Then a depth charge hit us right in the middle. We were sinking fast. We did not want to go down like that. We floated by, filling all our main tanks with air. The enemy was right in front of us. Bullets came like hail. Something ripped through my leg, and I fell into the water. Everything went black. Then I came to myself. Where do you think I was? I was on an operating table of the cruiser I was trying to sink. Water, water everywhere. Far as one could see, it was nothing but a rolling blue field of salt water. Yesterday one comrade fell out dead. Today another dropped out. How many have we lost so far? Cheer up, we have come farther west of Midway now. The war is just beginning, live everyone, well fight yet. The carrier was in flames and smoke. Then a torpedo hit her, she began to list. Everyone was trapped. Someone hammered his way out and the other followed. A life raft was lowered. As soon as we got in it, the carrier went down. How many days since then have we been rowing, one by one? Our comrades exhausted themselves and life went out of them. Comrades, comrades, you fought well. Welcome and join you soon, but we lost our senses. We did not see, we did not hear. We felt no more. We were dead. We could not even jump into the sea. Several days later, an American cruiser found us. We had promised our comrades in arms. We had vowed to follow them, and yet we lived as prisoners. Can you understand why we cannot live? Every day in the camp was like this. We were being tortured by our words of honour to our friends. They had given their lives and we were living. They had died in the finest tradition of the fighting man, and we were living in the most contemptuous state prisoners of the enemy. We had come to this state of affairs not because we wanted to. At least in the early stages of war, there was no voluntary surrender. Men of the Navy had floated as long as possible. They became exhausted and had no strength to commit suicide or resist capture. Men of the Army stayed in their positions for days and weeks without any supply of food or ammunition. They were either unconscious or too sick to know what was going on when they were taken. Every one of us was captured alive after we had fought furiously with all our might and mind. When we took the final step, a direct charge into an enemy position, we had fully expected to die in battle. Then something went wrong, and we were not killed. Worse still, we found ourselves in the hands of the enemy. We did not who the enemy was. The enemy was our opponent in battle. We had no hatred of the Americans as such. We only hated ourselves for failing in our duties and privileges. We hated our fate which had caused us to live after those death charges. We were simple-minded fighting men. Though there were older men among us, some of us were celibates. We had not thought of carnal pleasures. We had been so trained that our thinking was all concentrated on the most effective means of expending our lives for victory in war. Then we failed in the one thing we had lived for. Then, when we realised that we lived, we thought about our parents, relatives, wives, children and friends. They had no doubt buried us. We could imagine our funerals. We were heroes to them and to their neighbours. We were immortalised at the Yasukuni Shrine. The Emperor had gone there to conduct a ceremony for us. Thousands of people bowed before our souls. Our names had been published. Our relatives received medals and citations. Someone urged the people... Follow these men, the finest of all. Our country stands invincible, thanks to these immortal spirits. How could we face our people again? Death by suicide was the only logical solution to our predicament. Suicide in a prison camp would not be as glorious an end as death in combat. We had forfeited that privilege when we were captured, but in death we could redeem ourselves to those comrades who had given their lives on the battlefield. It would be belated, but not too late. 
Death in any form or by any means was better than failure to pay our debt to the country by living. We therefore considered our own individual ways of committing suicide. Our desire for suicide, however, was thwarted on every hand. We had no knives to cut our throats. We had no ropes to hang ourselves with. Some of us banged our heads against every object in sight, and yet we did not die. Some men refused to eat, but the idea of dying slowly was even more trying than living hungrily. Our life was one of dilemma. We wanted to die, and yet we could not die. We wanted to kill ourselves, and we could not. The dilemma had a decidedly deteriorating influence upon us. Under this dilemma, everyone lost all surface dignity and pretense, and became human with human problems, behaving like a human with many acute problems. This process was often sudden and crude. It exposed how much of our behaviour under normal conditions was put on, and how easily it peeled off. When we were stripped naked behind the barbed wire, we were compelled to look at ourselves as if we truly were a picture of failure. But it was not entirely our fault, we said. Fate has had something to do with it. We had no hope for the future. We were at the very bottom of life. We despised ourselves. We were in a perpetual state of spiritual shock as prisoners of war. Death demanded our allegiance, and yet life claimed our bodies. Images of past combat experiences kept coming back. The future was utterly bleak. Strong-bodied men went out of their minds. The fact that they were Japanese and prisoners at the same time and in the same person had made them insane. Like sick people recovering in a hospital under the best of care, we, the prisoners, well protected and well fed, given excellent medical treatment in case of illness, became healthier in body. But our mental reaction to our past and present expressed itself in a cocky arrogance toward officers of higher rank who to us symbolised oppression and regimentation in the past. Sometimes we disregarded all rules completely and acted as if we were animals. Not all of us, of course, were affected like this by the life of captivity. In fact, when new prisoners arrived in our camp, there were actually two distinct groups of men, one trying to maintain some order and reason, the other just the opposite. We old-timers extended them a warm welcome to assure them that life in camp was an experience in rehabilitation. Our camp was run in accordance with the provisions of the Geneva Convention. The camp was equipped with every necessity. The American authorities were not only efficient as administrators, but sympathetic as overseers of our recovery. We on our part recognised our dependence upon our captors and cooperated with them, obeying their orders and endeavouring to build our camp in an orderly manner. I made a speech every time we received new arrivals, which will indicate the line of thinking and behaviour I felt was necessary for me to suggest to the new prisoners. This is what I usually say. You have fought bravely at the front, and you were willing to give your life itself. I express my deep respect and appreciation. Now you and I are in the same situation. We are bound by the same fate. I can understand perfectly how you feel inside yourself. My sympathy for you has no reservations. However, since you have just arrived to start a new life with us in a cooperatively organised community, we would ask you to respect the regulations we have set up and to lead the kind of life you would not be ashamed of as a Japanese. This is a cooperative life, not a regimented life. If you have anything to say, no one is going to stop you. Please do not speak behind anyone's back. Bring it out into the open through the proper channels. How do we live here? What is our philosophy? I shall now explain it. First, if you stand in front of a mirror, what do you see? A human being. This is our starting point. Second, what does be human mean? It means that we are capable of organised social existence. We can and should act like members of human society. Third, we are prisoners of war. The United States government is our protector. We must abide by laws and regulations pertaining to prisoners of war. I know how trying it will be for you to beat prisoners but for your own sake I advise you to restrain yourself no matter how hard you find it. Fourth, we were all combatants once. We dealt in the business of destruction and death. But this camp is not a battlefield, I must emphasise that. I know that since your capture you have attempted more than once, at least in your mind, to take your life into your own hands. But you are now a prisoner, not a combatant, and your life is governed not by the lawlessness of war, but by an international agreement. If you have come up with any idea of yourself still being a soldier, abandon that idea at once. 
You are not a combatant anymore. You are about to begin a life as a civilized, organized, and cultivated person, fit to receive the benefits of international law. Fifth, we are not living here in isolation. The eyes of the world are upon us. What Americans think of us as they watch our daily conduct will have a far reaching bearing upon all Japanese. If we look untidy and behave noisily, they will think us uncivilized. Some Japanese civilians will be repatriated to Japan. They will report to our relatives. If our unbecoming conduct should reach their ears, we shall disgrace them, and we can never redeem ourselves to them who have died for us. Even if we commit harakari, it would not be enough. However, we must not live for the sake of what others may think of us. We must so live that we shall not be ashamed of ourselves. Sixth, let us consider the question of death. I refer to death by suicide. I contemplated it long before you did. It is imperative that we face this problem and think it through. No matter how much you may mourn over the uniform of a prisoner of war you are wearing, you cannot change the uniform. We do not like even to mention the words prisoner of war. We hate to be looked at. We do not want anyone to know it. But that is sheer vanity. The letters prisoner of war on our backs will not depress us so much if we think objectively. We are prisoners of war. We cannot be anything else right now. If you adjust your thinking to the status of a prisoner of war, you will not have to struggle so much. Your names are known to the Japanese government through the Swiss government. That you are prisoners of war is now public information. Death or any other escape method will not alter the fact that you were once a prisoner. There is no use mourning over it. I know how much you want to hold someone else responsible for your present condition, but whom can you so hold? Do not try to connect your present misery with someone else's shortcomings. That you are here is your own fate. It is the way the heavens have seen fit to treat you. Be a man. Be a human being. Return to your true self and rethink. Suppose you have decided to hang yourself, or fight the guard and be killed, or steal a knife from the kitchen and cut your throat. What will the people of the world think of you? You yourself may think that you have done your duty, but the people of other countries will not understand why you have killed yourself so many days after your capture. They will not think you brave or praise you for committing suicide. They will write about it in papers and laugh about it. You who have seen America, even a little bit, should certainly be able to understand what I am saying. We are men. We regret that we missed our chance for death at the front. But dying on the battlefield is not the only honorable way to die. To complete our duties as men and live until our natural death is another manly way. We should therefore resist every temptation to weaken. You had wanted to die. You should have died before coming here. You missed your last chance to commit suicide. You and I are now prisoners recognized as such by governments. There is no more honor or freedom for suicide. A suicide in the camp will only cause trouble for others. When we forget our small selves and return to reason, we will realize that the very fact that we have survived so far may reveal some unfamiliar things to us to do. This means that our capture is equal to our rebirth. We are born again. To live in humiliation as a prisoner of war may be more difficult than taking our own life, but it is our solemn obligation to live this renewed life as men.